So welcome. My name is Patrick, and today I will present you Blacksmith, Scalable Raw Hammering in the Frequency Domain. So we've seen in the past the draw hammer bit flips can compromise data integrity. And as a reaction to that, DRAM manufacturers such as Samsung and Micron deployed mitigations on their devices called target row refresh. These mitigations essentially try to estimate the rows that have been accessed most frequently and then send a preventive refresh before the periodic refresh happens. However, DRAM technology scaling has drastically reduced the number of hammers required by the aggressors to trigger bit flips. And this makes this estimation very challenging. Still today, there exists no tool or methodology that allows you to estimate how well these estimations work and to explore the corner cases. Today, I present you Blacksmith, a new tool that allows you to thoroughly assess TRAM devices. And we found with Blacksmith that TRR on all DDR4 and LPDDR for X devices in our test pool is broken. To get started, let, let me briefly introduce you um, DRAM and Rowhammer. So here you can see a PC UDIM with eight DRAM chips. Each of these chips is composed of um, multiple DRAM banks that are organized like a matrix. And to exploit Rowhammer, you typically have two aggressor rows here in red, and then you access them over and over again many times and very quickly. This leads to charges that leak from the capacitors in the victim row that is in between those two aggressor rows. And then eventually you will see a bit flip. It has been shown that rowhammer attacks are very practical in many different scenarios. For example, rowhammer is possible in the browser via JavaScript, on smartphones, and even over the network. It has also been shown that devices that use error correcting codes are vulnerable against rowhammer. So let me explain the Rohama problem a bit more in depth from an attacker's perspective. So you have to know that DRAM uses the DDR protocol. And this protocol is specified by the JDEC standard and um, it's a synchronous protocol. This means that all DRAM commands must adhere to specific timing requirements. One of these timing requirements is that each cell on a DRAM device has to retain its information for at least 64 milliseconds. And to achieve this, um, the memory controller in the CPU sends periodic refresh commands on DDR4 devices on average every 7.8 microseconds. And each of these refresh commands uh, refreshes a few of these cells in a DRAM device. And this can be visualized in a timeline. So here you can see a refresh window of 64 milliseconds. And in between of two consecutive refresh commands, we can issue around 166 activations. So this means that an attacker has around 1.3 million of activations where they can spread hammering their aggressors. And what existing patterns do, for example, six-sided patterns, is that they access the aggressors, for example here, aggressor one, aggressor two, and so forth, up to aggressor six. And then this builds the first round of pattern execution. And this then gets repeated over and over again, for example, end rounds covering a whole refresh interval. Let's now switch the perspective to the view of the def defense of the mitigation. So I will now explain how a mitigation works, a deterministic one, but there are also probabilistic ones. So during normal activation, um, there is a component in the device called a sampler, looks at the DRAM activation commands and tries to estimate the row that has been accessed most frequently. So in this example, it would be row D. And then stores this information in a data structure. And then at refresh time, there's another component called the inhibitor that takes this estimate, so here row D, and then sends a preventive, um, so an additional refresh called target row refresh to that row before any bit flips can happen. And this problem of estimating the most frequently activated row is a well-studied problem um, uh, solved by frequent item count algorithms. However, adapting those to DRAM devices is very challenging. Because in a DRAM device, we have limited area, so we cannot have a counter for each row. Then there are these timing requirements that I mentioned before. And existing mitigations are deployed in devices lack a proper form of security analysis. Another point is that DRAM is becoming more vulnerable. So if you look back when Rohammer was first discovered in 2012 with DDR3, around 139,000 activations were required to trigger bit flips. The newer devices uh, using DDR4 
produced in mid-2019 only require around 10,000 activations to aggressors to trigger bit flips. And this potentially allows us to craft new attack patterns where each of the aggressors is hammered less than before. So we started our investigation by looking at existing raw hammer patterns. So here you can see three examples. You can see a single-sided pattern where we have two aggressors that are far apart, the double-sided pattern that I showed before, and a four-sided pattern, which is an example for an n-sided pattern with n equals four. And we made the key observation that all of these existing patterns hammer the aggressors the same number of times, so with the same access frequency. And we asked ourselves if this is something that mitigations might have taken into account to facilitate tracking the aggressor rows. And for that, we wanted to know if non-uniformity can help to bypass raw hammer mitigations. To answer that, we have designed two experiments. So in the first experiment, we take n-sided patterns and introduce some non-uniformity by replacing aggressors in random rounds by a dedicated um, aggressor pair. So here in this example, rows 13 and 15. And in the second experiment, we have complete random patterns. So we have random sem same bank rows that we access and then at random rounds and random pattern locations, we access again a double-sided aggressor pair, here row one and three. And we run these two experiments on the 40 test devices that we uh, acquired from the three major manufacturers, Samsung, Hynix, and Micron. And here I present you the result of this experiment. So we compare our non-uniform patterns against n-sided patterns. And what we can see here is that non-uniformity is really needed on some devices to bypass the mitigations and trigger bit flips. So this is the first observation that we made, that non-uniform aggressor accesses can lead to effective patterns where previous n-sided patterns could not trigger any bit flips. Although this improved the results by around 15%, there are also cases where uniformity is needed to trigger bit flips. This is why we designed further experiment to explore which properties are important to build effective patterns. So we start with no assumptions and then gradually learn the properties that are important. I will now present the most interesting results from different devices. So the first thing that we wanted to know, when should we have an aggressor? And for that, we build the following experiment. So we have a double-sided aggressor pair targeting row one and three uh, with a length of one refresh interval, and then it is repeated. And in the next round of the experiment, we basically shift this aggressor pair um, by one position. So we do one axis to a random row of the same bank before, and then two axes, three axes, and so on. And what we observed here on DIM A10 from Samsung is that only if we hammer right before the refresh, we can trigger bit flips. And this is our second observation, that it's important to access the aggressors at the right time to bypass the mitigation. And here in this example, this can be explained by the mitigation, so the sampling might be less active or not active at all right before refresh. So this property and all other properties that I will introduce in the next slides can be mapped to concept of the frequency domain. So here the offset maps to the phase. In the next experiment, we wanted to know for how long should we have an aggressor? Because if we increase um, the time that we have an aggressor, we potentially can trigger more bit flips, and this makes exploitation easier. So we start again with the same experiment setup as before, that we shift um, this double-sided aggressor pair, but now additionally, we try more intensities. So instead of just hammering it one time, we also try two times, three times, etc. And what we observed here on this device A10 again, is that if we increase the intensity, we can trigger more bit flips, but only up to a certain sweet spot and then if we go over that sweet spot, then the number of bit flips drops. And this could be explained again by the sampler that might sample us too often if we have a too high hammering intensity and then sensor TRR before we can trigger any bit flips. And this concept can be mapped to the concept of an amplitude where a higher peak corresponds to a higher hammering intensity. And the last thing that we wanted to know if our pattern should be longer than, the, than just one refresh interval. As I mentioned before, devices are becoming more vulnerable, and this means that we can build patterns that are longer, that hammer um, aggressors less time than before. So here in this example, we consider a pattern of two refresh intervals. So this means we also have higher hammering intensities that go beyond just one refresh interval. 
And then there are combinations uh, where we end up, for example, here, um, where we only hammer every second refresh interval, but this interval with very high hammering intensity. And we made the observation that, in fact, exactly that is very important on some devices, like device B2 from Hynix. Only if we hammer with very long patterns and high intensities, we could trigger bit flips on these devices. And this property maps to the property of a frequency. For example, here, the frequency of a half would mean that we only hammer the aggressor pair uh, one and three uh, every second refresh interval. So from these four observations, we derived this property, frequency, phase, and amplitude, that we use to build frequency-based raw hammer access patterns. But now the question is, how to determine effective parameter values? Because the parameters depend on the mitigation that is deployed on the device, and these mitigations um, are different um, across vendors and also on different devices from the same vendor. And we wanted to have a solution that is scalable that allows us to test a large number of different devices, a generic solution. This is why we generalized our observations to these three properties, and an extensible solution. So if vendors make any change, we can refine our model. And for this, we built the Blacksmith Rowhammer fuzzer. And the idea of Blacksmith is the following. We have the frequency, phase, and amplitude that we randomize for the different aggressors in our pattern. And we do this in a way so that we have compatible values so that we can um, combine them into one pattern. Then we hammer the pattern and we check for bit flips. And then we repeat this procedure over again. I will now explain how this pattern building process works. So here you can see an example. We have um, four times six excesses in this simple example. And so we start with step one, where we have an aggressive pair a1 and A2, for example, we choose the frequency of a half, so we exit only every second uh, base period. Then in step two, we fill up the same offset, but in the second base period. Now the amplitude is locked to one, so we make this um, to simplify the pattern creation. And we could choose, for example, the frequency of a quarter. And then in the third step, we could add um, also at offset zero, um, the aggressors A5 and A6, also with a frequency of a quarter. And then in the fourth step, we could add the aggressors A7 and A8 with uh, amplitude for, of two, for example, and a frequency of a half. And then in the last step, again, we would be forced to use an amplitude of two, and we could have um, aggressors A9 and A10 with a frequency of a half, for example. And in this way, we craft the patterns. So we have different frequency phase and amplitudes combined into one pattern, which makes the fuzzing very effective. And we run Blacksmith on all 40 devices in our test pool, and Blacksmith found effective patterns on all 40 devices, which shows that TRR is broken. And we compared the results to state-of-the-art Rohama fuzzle trespass, which only found um, bit flips on 15 of 40 devices. Blacksmith also found a considerably high number of bit flips on some devices. For example, device A17 from Samsung, there we found around 138,000 bit flips. This, of course, also has a significant impact on the exploitation. That's why we also looked into existing raw hammer exploits. So in our paper, we analyzed three exploits. The PTE exploit worked on 30 or 40 devices, and we found exploitable bit flips in between three seconds and two hours and eight minutes. For details um, on the other attacks that we also looked into, I kindly refer you to the paper. And to the conclude, the PC um, evaluation so 100% of all devices in our test pool are broken, and the DIMMs are weaker than reported before. The high number of bit flips facilitates the exploitation. We also looked into LPDDR for X chips, which are used, for example, in smartphones and ultrabooks, and we also found there that all of these devices are broken. If you want to know more about this part of our evaluation, I kindly refer you to our paper. So this concludes my talk. We've seen that Blacksmith compared with fuzzing and non-uniform frequency-based patterns is a very scalable and highly effective approach. And we showed that all current TRR mitigations are vulnerable. Blacksmith's approach also generalizes well. So there was another DRAM vendor that we did not include in our evaluation that approached us and wanted to know if their devices are safe. And we ran Blacksmith on these devices and found bit flips in less than four hours, although we have never seen those devices before, so we didn't do any experiments and observations on them. And our work stresses that we really need 
principled mitigations with provable security guarantees instead of the obscure and proprietary mitigation that DRAM vendors currently use. And if you want to know how to design such principled mitigations, I kindly invite, invite you to the talk of my colleague Michele about ProTRR, principled yet optimal in DRAM target draw refresh. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Patrick. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, so my first question is, oh, thank you for uh, the amazing talk. My first question is, um, have you tested multiple uh, DIMs together? No, we only tested always one DIM, um, okay. just because of the addressing functions. Uh, they are known uh, for a single DIM setup. So this makes okay. it easier. But in theory, you could also test multiple DIMs, for example, um, to increase the efficiency of fuzzing. That's true. Uh, so from my understanding, uh, every single of these vendors would have their own proprietary TRR mechanism, right? Yeah, and it even changes across different devices of the same manufacturer. Okay. But there is a kind of correlation. So we looked into uh, applying all the patterns that we found across the devices on all the devices. And we saw that, for example, if we take patterns uh, that we found on Samsung, that there might be one pattern that works on multiple DIMMs. So they are like golden patterns, you could say. OK, OK. Uh, so I have one more question. Uh, Blacksmith requires a large number of things to be maintained in terms of timing. Uh, like, if you want to carry out this attack from JavaScript, uh, like, is, will it be practical enough to like, keep a track of so many timing parameters? Like, you have to get them correct, right? Yeah, but we use uh, side channels for that. So basically, you only put in into Blacksmith the number of activations that you can do. Yeah. You can determine that with a side channel uh, with, with him, uh, between two consecutive refreshes. And um, then Blacksmith generates a pattern that works with that value. And that during execution, you again use a side channel to detect when the refresh happens. So they are always aligned with the refreshes. Okay. So it should be possible, I think. Uh, flushing um, the accesses from the cache would be the major challenge to realize it in JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, Alyssa Milburn, Intel. Um, have you tried the ECC-based attacks with this? No, we haven't looked into that. Do you plan to? Um, no, there are no current efforts in that direction, yeah. But it's okay. uh, definitely something I mean, I'd love to see it mm -hmm. if anyone else is looking into this kind of thing. So, but thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. I have a question to you. You said um, one of, there was a vendor who approached you and asked you to study their devices. Were you studying their TRR mechanism or you're st studying their underlying sort of medium of how, did, it, did those devices have TRR in them? Yes, they also had a mitigation, um, and so we did not include them because a small sure. vendor, um, and they sent us some sample devices as ODIMs, so DIMs so, that are So my, my question is, do they outsource this TRR? Like, how, they're building their own devices. Don't, don't they understand how their TRR works? Like, wh why, why would they ask you to study it, to uh, discover if it works Only to or test not? if they're vulnerable, because they claimed in their DDR3 devices um, that they have, um, a design that allows you them to, to mitigate raw hammer, and that they, that's why they wanted to know if DDR4, their DDR4 device is also safe. And, and did they share with you how their TRR works? No, no. Did you consider asking them, hey, tell me how TRR works, and then I'll tell you exactly the right pattern of breaking this? Isn't that sort of? They're interested in the mitigation of my colleague, Michele, okay. um, but I think they did not share with us any details about exactly uh, how their mitigation works. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's thank.